Uh, Dr. Mary Jane Limpat is a neuro-oncologist at the Odette Cancer Center at Sunnybrook Health Sciences and a clinical clini clinician, sorry, investigator at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto. She has a clinical interest in treating patients with CNS tumors and neurological complications of cancer, including nervous system metastases. She also has a clini clinical interest in young adult patients with gliomas. Uh, she is a recent graduate of the Joint Neuro-Oncology Fellowship Program at Massachusetts General Hospital, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School. Her research interest is in using large patient cohort data sets to study the relationship between imaging, genetic biomarkers, and clinical outcomes in patients with gliomas. This presentation will review the current use of molecular and genomic uh, markers in glioma and clinical care and some of the potential benefits and current limitations. We will also discuss how these markers are impacting management decisions for specific groups of patients with gliomas, in particular young adult patients. And this topic is the topic that you had submitted for um, the research grant. So uh, Dr. Limfat is one of our research grant recipients from 2021. So congratulations to that. And uh, the floor is yours to take it over. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janik, and thank you to BTFC, first off, for the opportunity to speak today and also for this wonderful grant. Um, you know, if any donors are on the line, this is where your money goes to try to improve outcomes to, uh, you know, all sorts of populations of brain tumors. I'm very thankful for that opportunity and for that grant. And we'll switch gears a little bit, and I also want to thank Kylie for sharing her a very moving story with us today. I think this is the patient perspective that we all need when we talk about what we're doing for research and in the clinics, because at the end of the day, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people like Kylie and others on the line to just have a, you know, a better life and, and you know, a much more uh, longer and, and better quality time with their families as well. So today, uh, like I mentioned, I wanted to talk about molecular markers and glioma in particular. And I just wanted to say that my presentation will talk about some molecular testing that are not necessarily what we call standard of care across all institutions. So you may or may not have access to these tests or these tests may or may not have been offered to you. And every patient's situation is a bit different. So speak with your primary team. Uh, to, to discuss, you know, what may or may not be an option uh, available to you. So briefly, what I was hoping to cover today are these following questions, as these are questions that come up a lot in our clinic. So, you know, people hear a lot about molecular testing and gliomas, but we don't know, you know, often which ones are the most re relevant ones for each patient. So that's an important thing to go over. And uh, the next question we often get is, how does the testing change the treatment plan or approach to each person's tumor? So does it impact your diagnosis, the prognosis or treatment considerations? And uh, the last thing is, does everyone need molecular testing? Uh, understanding that you know, within the single peer system in Canada, some testing may be available uh, you know, and is covered by OHIP, but some may not be. And, uh, do, does everyone need to undergo the same type of testing or uh, do we have to consider special populations and special uh, needs within uh, different groups? So I'll cover all of that today. Uh, but first, let's take a step back and talk about brain tumors in general. I think this uh, group is uh, well versed in this, but just to review, we talk about primary brain tumors when brain tumors arise from cells in the brain. And these are different than secondary brain tumors or brain metastases, which are cancers in the body, uh, for example, breast cancer, or lung cancer that eventually go to the brain. So today we'll be talking about primary brain tumors in particular gliomas. And glioblastoma is the most common malignant primary brain tumor. It is still quite rare. So its incidence is about 4.1 per 100,000 cases per year. And um, unfortunately, the overall survival, as uh, we know for GBM remains quite poor. So GBM is the most aggressive one, but for sure there are other types of lower grade tumors uh, that have a much better prognosis. So we've come to an understanding of these tumors by looking at biomarkers and in particular, some molecular biomarkers. So taking a step back again to understand how molecular biomarkers have become part of uh, clinical practice in gliomas, 
I think Kylie's stories, uh, you know, sorry, uh, did talk about this a little bit in the fact that, you know, we often require a biopsy. We, we, we need a biopsy essentially to be 100% certain as to what a type of tumor is. We can look at the MRI and say, this looks like a low-grade glioma as was in her case. Um, but, you know, to know at 100%, we need to have tissue. And this can be quite challenging, especially in cases like hers, where the tumor was in an eloquent area of the brain or in a part of the brain that houses vital function. So things like language, movement, uh, surgeons don't necessarily want to go in there unless they have to, because surgery comes with specific risks. So we are uh, limited by what we can do. And uh, before 2016, how we used to diagnose these brain tumors is that you know, after surgery, when we have a sample of this tissue, pathologists would look under the microscope and see what the cells look like. Do they look like they're aggressive cells or do they look like they're more benign cells? And then grade the tumor uh, based on that from a grade one to a grade four. And this is how we get our diagnosis of glioblastoma versus the low grade tumor, for example. But as you can imagine, there was a lot of difficulties with that. So first, if you're, you have a very small amount of tissue and you're not looking in the right place, you may undercall or overcall, well, mostly undercall a tumor. Um, and you know, there can be some variability from pathologist to pathologist when they're also reviewing the tissue. So it was not a perfect system. So in 2016, there was a revision to the classification of brain tumors, and that's because we are now using more and more molecular or genetic markers. So these are different from looking at the tissue under the microscope. We send the tissue for specific mutations, and we know that certain mutations are you know, associated with uh, more aggressive behavior because tumors acquire these mutations as they become more aggressive. So looking at these molecular markers, we can now confirm the diagnosis. Um, so knowing exactly what type of tumor it is, is it a glioma? Is it another type of tumor? Uh, convey prognosis, meaning do we think that this is a more aggressive tumor because of the genetic changes that it has undergone? And we can also now, uh, in some cases, match patients with specific therapy. So there is a mutation for which there is a targeted drug, and we think that mechanistically it can help reduce the tumor growth down the line. So because this is a little bit uh, you know, uh, confusing in terms of what we mean by molecular markers and genetic markers, I just wanted to sort of go back and explain a few things as well. So, when we deal with the cancer, it is usually because something happens in the normal uh, process of cell division. The cells acquire a mutation and start undergoing division that is not controlled. And there's a number of mutations that can happen uh, from uh, the start of a cell uh, that will lead it to become um, more aggressive. And in some cases, uh, you know, th there are multiple mutations that need to happen for it to become more and more aggressive. So um, certain genes, like I mentioned, are mutated in cancer cells that are not mutated in normal cells. And when we mean, when we talk about genetic mutations, this is exactly what we mean. We mean that these specific cells in someone's brain somehow started undergoing these mutations and then became malignant. Um, there's often a little bit of confusion when we use the term genetic. A lot of people think we mean that it is inheritable or familial, meaning that it gets passed down to our kids, but that is not the case. So it, it's a mutation that happens within someone's tumor, and this is not something that is passed down genetically, unless there's a very strong family history of brain cancer, for example, but that's usually due to another uh, sort of inheritable condition. And when we talk about uh, someone being a mutant in a gene, that means that that particular gene carries a mutation. And the opposite of that, and I'll, I'm just highlighting these terms as I'll be using a few of them in the next few slides, the opposite of being mutant is being wild type. So you carry the normal variant of the gene. 
And how do we assess these alterations in glioma? So there are several techniques and many of these will continue to evolve over time. We can stay in slides to look under the microscope uh, as to whether or not a mutation is present. We can do what we call chromosomal analysis. We can do also next generation sequencing, which is looking at DNA and RNA. And uh, I think some of you may have heard about Foundation One Medicine and the molecular testing that they do. So theirs is a type of next generation sequencing. And now uh, we are also uh, starting to use methylation profiling, more so in the research environment, but that's another way of detecting molecular changes. And again, currently not all of these techniques are part of standard of care. And some like methylation profiling, for example, is only available at certain centers for research. And the tests can be quite costly. So, you know, if people are paying, for example, out of pocket for foundation one testing, some of their panels typically run uh, to the order of a thousand to two thousand um, dollars, depending on the panel that people pick. Um, so how um, has the grading and the classification of gliomas evolved in the context of these new biomarkers? So first off, um, we know that we still need to look under the microscope at the type of glioma uh, that we have, at the type of cell that's present. But the second big branch point, and I'm sure some of you have already heard about this, is whether or not an IDH mutation is present. And this is because we know that IDH mutant tumors, so the ones uh, over here uh, in pink, uh, tend to behave in a, in a more indolent way. And those that do not carry the mutation, so the IDH wild type tumors, tend to be the ones that are more aggressive, like the glioblastoma that is right here. The next sort of big branch point is whether or not someone has a 1P19Q codeletion. This is another uh, biomarker. And what this tells us if someone has this codeletion is that we are dealing with a type of glioma called an oligodendroglioma. And this distinction is also important because we know that patients with oligodendroglioma in general tend to do better than patients that have astrocytomas. And the way that we treat them is quite different as well. Um, lastly, another biomarker that uh, you may have heard being used in the care of glioma patient is this MGMT promoter methylation. And that one is more relevant uh, for patients who have a diagnosis of glioblastoma, and it can help us make treatment decisions as I'll uh, go over in a little bit, because having an MGMT promoter methylation will help uh, tell us whether or not we think people will respond to particular types of treatment like temozolomide and radiation. So let's now focus on how um, molecular advances uh, have impacted the care in IDH mutant tumors. So again, we're dealing with this side of uh, the flow chart here, which tends to be tumors that behave a bit more indolently. So I'm sure some of you have seen uh, MRIs in the past. Uh, this area uh, of white here represents this IDH mutant tumor. And as you can see, um, it can it is visible, but it can look a lot less um, aggressive or indolent than the glioblastomas that I will show you in a little bit. So we this slide looks very busy, but all to say that when we look at IDH mutant gliomas, um, after we have confirmed the diagnosis, so with a biopsy or resection, is when we are able to further stratify them within these groups. So to someone's point earlier about whether or not temozolomide was used in Kylie's case, um, you know, we're not able to make that distinction or that recommendation yet, because again, we don't know where she would fall within these without a tissue diagnosis. And then based on that, and based on understanding what type of tumor someone has, and based on other, uh, what we call prognostic factors, so things that we think will determine how they do uh, with their tumor, um, looking at their age, their neurological deficits, uh, how big the tumor is, and what type of resection they had, we're able to make recommendations. So uh, sometimes that is watching and waiting after surgery, uh, and sometimes that is radiation followed by uh, chemotherapy. 
And the type of chemotherapy can depend on the type of tumor that you have. So if you have an oligodendrogliomas, some centers will recommend getting PCV chemotherapy and some centers also uh, use temozolomide. So that can be uh, a, a bit of a practitioner-based uh, preference as well. Um, so all to say that we are stratifying those molecular biomarkers in conjunction with uh, the other prognostic factors to then make a treatment recommendation. But it's not as easy as that. So as, as we've talked about, there are a lot of questions. And you know, again, this ties in very nicely with Kylie's story because you know, we don't know um, when necessarily the right time to intervene is uh, in these tumors, especially in young patients where we have to worry about the side effects of the treatments that we are proposing. So IDH mutant tumors are predominantly a tumor of young adults. And like I said, they can behave indolently and appear radiologically benign. So it's perfectly okay to observe them for some time before uh, treating them, especially if um, uh, the, the tumor itself is in a difficult location. So ideally, you know, in a perfect world, we would be able to take out the entire tumor and treat it. And a lot of the times that treatment can entail radiation therapy and chemotherapy, but we know that these treatments also over time can come with side effects. So we have to weigh all of this uh, in making that decision. One thing I have to mention is that uh, there is a lot of uh, research and a lot of progress that has been made in not only understanding these tumors, but maybe in thinking about other ways to treat them that will uh, maybe circumvent the need for radiation and chemotherapy. So we know that IDH mutant tumors arise because of a mutation in the IDH enzyme. So this is uh, where that genetic mutation takes place and then leads to the formation of a low-grade or high-grade IDH mutant tumor. Um, and if we can just target that mutation or target that mutant enzyme, technically we will down the line reduce the formation of the tumor. So this busy slide is all to say that, you know, there are inhibitors that uh, we're looking at on the research front that will be able to specifically inhibit these mutant enzymes and hopefully, you know, prevent this down uh, downstream um, activation of the pathway that leads to the formation of these tumors. Um, so one particular IDH inhibitor trial that is worth mentioning, as it is now open in many centers in Canada, including in Ontario and BC, is this Indigo trial that uses an oral IDH inhibitor in patients who have low-grade gliomas that have been resected. So we're very excited that our patients have been able to go on this study uh, because, you know, down the line, hopefully this is the way of the future, that we'll be able to give an oral medication to patients following surgery and then prevent the need for other interventions like uh, radiation or more toxic chemotherapy. So as I mentioned, the benefits of targeted therapy in IDH mutant tumors uh, in theory is that, you know, uh, we are blocking the pathway specifically at the site that is needed. So then, you know, you would reduce side effects uh, on the whole body or, you know, from a systemic standpoint from other types of therapy. And early phase studies also suggest that these drugs are very well tolerated without frequent uh, significant side effects. And they may also prevent therapy-induced resistance and transformation of the tumor down the line, which we know can happen even when we treat with, uh, uh, with chemotherapy and with radiation. We know that tumors can somehow figure out a way to develop resistance and become more malignant. So as I said, you know, we focused on the left side of the chart earlier. We'll look into how uh, molecular uh, markers are now affecting care in uh, IDH wild type tumors, which in includes glioblastoma. So if you remember the MRIs I showed earlier where there were small areas of um, brightness in the MRI, this is what in comparison a GBM looks like. So it can be larger, you know, more aggressive looking and can actually cross over in the brain. Um, so essentially, there are many ways in which molecular markers have helped uh, change 
management in glioblastoma. The very first important way is that it has actually changed the way we define glioblastoma. So if you remember earlier, I was talking about how we used to grade these tumors by looking at them under the microscope. So we would look at uh, the, the tissue under the slide to see, for example, if they look like they were rapidly multiplying, if there was signs of what we call necrosis or uh, changes in the blood vessels, and that would give you uh, a grading for a grade four, which we would then call glioblastoma. But we now understand that the grading doesn't equate to the IDH status. So first off, we know that to have a glioblastoma now, we need a tumor that it is IDH wild type. So say you had these features that I described and you were graded as a grade four, but you had an IDH mutation, we have to now call these tumors grade four IDH mutant astrocytomas. We're not calling them IDH mutant glioblastoma anymore because we know that what drives the formation of these tumors is quite different and that these patients do much better than the patients that have an IDH wild type uh, tumor, a, a true glioblastoma. So that's one distinction. And then the other, uh, on the other hand, what we are also now doing, again, you know, going back to the fact that grading is not that accurate, is that if you have a grade two or three astrocytoma, but you don't have an IDH mutation, so your IDH wild type, if you have in addition some molecular, uh, some mutations, so the EGFR amplification, the TERP promoter mutation, you can be quote unquote upgraded to a molecular glioblastoma. And that's very important because we know that how we would um, counsel patients on treatment, therapies, prognosis, and clinical trial relies on this accurate diagnosis. So all to say um, that grading has become less, um, less accurate and molecular classification in glioblastoma has become more important. So, you know, just as a refresher or as a, as a primer for patients who are, for people who are not, um, you know, um, already aware of the treatment for glioblastoma, we typically uh, treat patients with GBM following surgery with a course of radiation and chemotherapy together, followed by what we call adjuvant chemotherapy. So a period where we give uh, chemotherapy alone without radiation. And this is what we've been doing basically since 2005, since this large study came out that showed that the addition of temozolomide with radiation really helped prolong uh, survival in patients with glioblastoma compared to radiation alone. Um, and the, the MGMT comes in here, as I mentioned before, because we know that this MGMT status can predict even further whether or not we think patients will respond to this STRU protocol or to our standard of care. So what MGMT is, is it's a DNA repair enzyme that rescues tumor cells from temozolomide induced damage. So the chemotherapy works on the, the cancer cells by breaking up their DNA. And if your DNA repair enzyme is working, basically what that will do is that it will just undo what the chemotherapy has done. But if you have a methylated or defective MGMT, you will have a better response to this treatment because essentially that enzyme isn't able to work anymore. So we can see here in this survival curve, which is basically showing uh, that you know, the percentage of patients that are uh, alive at X number of months, that the patients that are methylated actually do much better than the patients who are unmethylated. So we can see that there is a difference there in the percentage that have survived, for example, at 36 months. And that's important to us because we're dealing, unfortunately, with a disease still in need, still in need of a cure and where quality of life is extremely important as our patients can have a limited amount of time. So putting patients through chemotherapy when you do not think that there's a high chance of success really needs to be weighed against the side effects and patients need to be counseled about this in clinic. So as you see, the recommendations for management 
uh, relies now heavily on this MGMT promoter methylation. So sometimes if someone is non-methylated, for example, we'll choose to actually just do radiation alone, uh, or we'll choose not to follow up uh, with more chemotherapy after the initial course of radiation. I think more importantly, you know, this is a group where we have now identified a bigger need for clinical trials because we know that the standard of care isn't as effective. So a lot of upfront clinical trials in glioblastoma actually are accruing patients who are MGMT and methylated. So knowing that status ahead of time is very helpful. And that's one test that I, I think is now uh, quite routine across all centers in, uh, in North America, or at least it should be. And so the last application of molecular sequencing in glioblastoma that I want to talk about, and I don't want anyone to get scared by this slide that looks very busy, is just again to show that when we talk about these pathways that get disrupted that cause the formation of, uh, of tumors, we can see here in the white boxes that there are a lot of um, investigational agents that are being looked at that can target these particular mutations uh, within the aberrant pathway. So identifying these mutations in each patient's tumor would in theory allow us to know which pathways to target and maybe which clinical trial, which drug to try in patients down the line. So, so that's sort of where we are aiming to be, hopefully in the next five to 10 years, where we can identify a specific you know, area of dysfunction and treat it right at that area. So to show you what an exceptional responder to targeted therapy looks like, uh, this is a patient of mine that I saw at Dana-Farber uh, that had this mutation in this BRAF V600E uh, gene, and she had an adult uh, type glioblastoma. And as you can see here, this was uh, her tumor, uh, which is bright on her MRI. And she was started on a targeted treatment uh, because this mutation actually is, is quite common in other cancers like melanoma, uh, and, and we do have agents that they use in melanoma to target this, this mutation, uh, we were able to uh, study it in a clinical trial in patients with glioblastoma. And we can see here that her tumor actually responded quite well to this treatment. And she actually maintained that response for close to a couple of years. So she eventually recurred, but you know that provided her with a long time of what we call progression-free survival. And it's, it's a much, uh, much better of a track record that some of our other treatments have had. And she tolerated this beautifully as well. It's an oral agent that uh, she was taking uh, every day, but uh, no significant side effect. And as you can see here, objectively, the tumor actually almost completely went away. So then I think that the next logical question is, should we be looking for targetable mutations in all glioma patients? Um, so this is a question that I've been personally very interested in because you know the system here in Canada is very different than uh, the one that I trained in in the states, where basically you know most patients could have access to this at at, an, at a center with specialized uh, CNS oncology. Um, but it's much more difficult here in our single peer system because these are not necessarily covered by OHIP uh, as they are not yet changing the standard of care. So, you know, are the, the NCCN guidelines, which are the guidelines in the US that uh, provide uh, guidance on how to deal with uh, brain tumors in general, they do recommend that we complement the standard analysis by uh, with a molecular information. However, I think here in Canada, we're still behind a little bit in that not all of these tests are available for all of our patients. Uh, we know that these panels, like, in, like I mentioned, can cost up to several thousands of dollars depending on the mutations that are offered on each panel. And the challenge is really that while some actionable mutations can be found, like the case that I showed you, uh, these are quite rare still in, in brain tumor patients. So that BRAF V600E mutation, for example, is only present in 
less than 5% of glioma. So not a lot of patients will have that. Uh, there are certain groups of patients that are more likely to have it, such as young adult patients. So I think the important thing to remember when we look at uh, the cost and the value is that um, you know, it may not benefit all patients alike, but if we do find a target and there is a drug, that it can really change the management in some of our patients. So one patient population that I mentioned that benefits the most from molecular testing are young adult patients because we know that their tumors are biologically very different uh, from the ones uh, in older adults. So the typical glioblastoma, for example, uh, may not benefit as much uh, as uh, pediatric type tumors that are found in young adults. So this, these are just some examples of some tumors that I think, uh, you know, have a potential where molecular um, stratification or molecular profiling can actually help change management. Um, therefore, I think it becomes much more relevant to try to find these uh, markers and mutations in young adult patients. So anyone who has a diagnosis, I would say under 40, um, should, you know, ideally in a, in a perfect world, have access to more molecular testing. Um, so outside of their biological differences, a reason why I want to highlight young adult patients today is that we know that the mortality rates across adolescent and young adult cancers, and, and by that I mean anyone who's aged from 12 to 40 has declined overall, but increased in CNS tumors. And CNS tumors are unfortunately a main cause of cancer-related morbidity in these patients. Uh, we know that these are patients that often transition from a pediatric to adult center, and they can be lost to follow up if they are just sent back to the community. So they really need to be seen at specialized centers. Um, so we need uh, to have a multidisciplinary care uh, for these patients. So uh, I think, you know, uh, we alluded to social work support earlier. A psychosocial support, neurocognitive assessments, oncofertility discussions, these are all needed in patients who are younger and, and are diagnosed with a brain tumor. And, and they, these patients are still uh, quite underrepresented in clinical trials, and that's something that uh, you know, our, our brain tumor group as a community needs to really change in the future. And I think that's why um, I think uh, BTFC's uh, community uh, can really help in, in highlighting these issues in young adult patients uh, with brain tumors as well. So in an effort to address the gaps that I just mentioned, we started an initiative in Toronto, which I'm really happy to share with you guys today, uh, which is our Adolescent and Young Adult CNS Oncology Consortium. So these are rounds that we are now holding that are basically across Canada, uh, where we, um, a group of uh, practitioners come together to discuss challenging cases uh, of young adult patients with brain tumors. So for example, uh, if we were to take Kylie's case, you know, we would show her images uh, and there would be a panel made up of uh, neurosurgeons and neuro-oncologists and radiation oncologists that would discuss, for example, the, the benefits and the risk of going for a surgery in her case. And then usually, you know, the, the, the presenting physician is the one who sees the patient in clinic and brings forward her case and then um, provides a recommendation to the patient after. We found this extremely beneficial because as you can imagine, getting multiple opinions on cases like that is extremely helpful, but also for patients on which we have tissue and we can identify um, specific mutations, we are then able to brainstorm and talk about clinical trials that are available at the different sites, about treatment strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I mentioned that sometimes it can be very difficult to obtain molecular testing. And the way that our group has been able to overcome that is that we actually applied for a grant to get money to pay for the molecular testing for the cases that are presented at rounds. So it's really become a, an evolving uh, project that is really translating into uh, the clinic and impacting clinical care. And something that I think uh, would be really interesting to push forward in terms of advocacy down the line. 
Um, to further illustrate uh, this growing movement to study and improve outcomes in young adult patients, I want to highlight a few projects that are happening in the adolescent and young adult glioma space. So there's a project right now looking at low-grade glioma over time uh, from Julie Bennett at SickKids. Um, there's also a, a big uh, funded project looking at young adults with brain uh, tumor uh, over time and seeing how they uh, progress across their cancer journey. And lastly, again, to put my little plug in and, and thank the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, uh, this grant that I received will look at assessing molecular clinical and imaging predictors of uh, response, including neurocognitive outcomes in young adults with low-grade glioma. So this is something that I look forward to sharing with all of you uh, again, hopefully in a few years when we have collected more data. So in the last few minutes, let's summarize where we are in terms of molecular markers and what we should be looking forward to. So here's what it, where I think we are in 2021. So we've identified that uh, molecular markers can help us with refining diagnosis, we know that targeted therapies are sort of the, the next big hurdle to overcome. If we can find better therapies that can be effective, then we'll really be making our way here where we can use this, uh, these molecular markers to be able to help every single patient with a brain tumor find the right therapy for them at the right time. So this, is, this should really be the goal here. Um, the challenge, though, is manifold, and especially around this little mountain here, because uh, even if we find some agents that do well in the lab, so on uh, animal models, et cetera, it's quite challenging to actually deliver everything to the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. And clinical trials can take time, especially in a relatively rare disease like glioma. So we need to enroll a lot of patients and observe them over a long period of time uh, and potentially test out many uh, different agents to really find a good one that works. So, so this is actually uh, you know, quite uh, significant when we, we talk about the barriers to finding effective therapies in glioma. So how are we uh, making strides in all of these areas? So there are now new methods of drug delivery to the central nervous system. And one of them is uh, this uh, technique called the focus ultrasound, uh, which uh, was actually uh, spearheaded uh, on the world stage uh, at Sunnybrook. And we now have um, a number of different trials that are open, uh, looking at uh, opening up the blood-brain barrier and administrating uh, treatments for patients with either newly diagnosed recurrent uh, or recurrent glioblastoma or CNS metastasis. Uh, so this is something that hopefully you'll hear more about down the line and we can start testing out uh, other drugs in combination with focus ultrasound to ensure that there is a high concentration of, of the drug that reaches the brain and the tumor. So another way that we're improving uh, our um, trying to get to finding more effective therapy, I should say, is that we're refining clinical trials to improve efficiency. So one big trial that is now open at Sunnybrook and Princess Margaret in that the MNI is called this, uh, is called a GBM ad agile trial, where we are um, using a rapidly adaptive trial with multiple arms at a time and a lot of interim analysis. So we uh, look at the data before we reach that endpoint to try to optimize the amount of time that someone has to be on these trials in order to make uh, a meaningful conclusion. So using this uh, you know, schema and improved platform for trials, we should be able to reduce the time to get to meaningful conclusions, but also reduce the amount of patients that we need for clinical trials. And lastly, there's a need to improve and encourage research outside of clinical trials. And this is an important point to stress because it's not mutually exclusive. Patients can be a part of a clinical trial and also be part of a non-clinical trial research study. And I think collection of patient data over time and databases, for example, can provide helpful information 
in rare diseases such as glioma. And this is why at Sunnybrook, we have launched an initiative where all gliomas will be sequenced and patient outcomes and imaging variables will be captured uh, to better help us understand how these molecular predictors affect things like survival, but also quality of life, neurocognitive function, et cetera. Also, hopefully down the line, we'll be able to incorporate what we call non-invasive biomarkers. So looking at biomarkers in blood and cerebrospinal fluid uh, to give us more information. Um, lastly, I would just like to drive home that every patient can make a difference as collection of this data over time, uh, like I mentioned, will really help us uh, come to better conclusions uh, when it comes to the evolution of gliomas in general. So in summary, testing for molecular biomarkers is important for an accurate diagnosis in brain tumors. And in the future, it will help match patients to the right therapies or clinical trials. Again, we're not there yet, but I think this is where we should be heading. And patients can contribute to research in biomarkers, which can improve our understanding of the evolution of brain tumors. And um, again, th this may in particular benefit young adult patients, a group where research is currently lacking. And last but not least, I think advocacy groups such as BTFC can really help improve access to biomarker testing in Canada, and especially to ensure that as we implement this, uh, we are not causing more disparity in access as we move towards making this testing available for everyone in Canada. And lastly, precision and collaborative uh, care in CNS oncology is here. Patients have a major role to play specifically in research and advocacy, and the time is now. So um, this uh, is all for my presentation today. Really just wanted to thank first and foremost, all of our patients and their caregivers. Uh, you are the reason for which we are uh, involved in research and we are in clinic. Um, so thank you for your support and for being strong advocates for yourselves and for your loved ones. I would also like to thank the CNS Oncology Group at the Odette Cancer Center um, and at Sunnybrook, and also uh, to my colleagues across U of T and uh, my partners across Ontario and Canada. And last and not least, to the BTFC again for your support and for the opportunity to present today. Thank you so much, Dr. Limfat. That was a great presentation and you really explained things in a way that, um, let me show my video here, that uh, helped us understand. So thank you for that. Um, that uh, consortium that you guys have put together for the adolescent and young adult groups, that's, that's such an amazing collaboration. <clears throat> Excuse me, and at Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, we do offer programming for those two populations. So if there's any, if there's ever any opportunity for us to come and speak to the to the uh, consortium, I'm sure our support team would be uh, would be open to that, to sharing the different resources and and programs that we do do for adolescents and young adults now, uh, the last few years. So we do have quite a few questions that have come through. So um, I'll just uh, read them to you, if um, you're good for for staying on for a few more mm -hmm, minutes. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So the first question was why the difference between practitioners using temozolomide and those using PCV? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the, the data, uh, this uh, sort of variability really has to do with the fact that we have not done a clinical trial that compares these two head to head, meaning, you know, radiation plus temozolomide versus radiation plus PCV in patients with either astrocytomas or oligodendroglioma. There is a trial that's underway, but as you know, because our patients survive for a very long time, you know, we won't have results from this trial for another decade, maybe. Um, I would have to say that it's not a Canada thing. Uh, you know, when I was in the US at Dana-Farber, they would prefer one regimen and at MGH, they would prefer another regimen. And that all has to do with the fact that we know that temozolomide is better tolerated but that PCV has, in theory, better uh, data in terms of the survival. So we always, I personally always discuss both with patients. I know sometimes, you know, there's a bit of a balance touching upon the point of, you know, the provider has to make the decision for the patient. But I think sometimes it's a two-way conversation and we come to that decision together. So I always explain that, you know, we have better data for PCV. Temozolomide is much better tolerated. 
we haven't done a head-to-head -head comparison, but my recommendation would be to go with X or Y. Thank you. Another question was, could a chemotherapy that has been clinically proven as to not have any effect on a wild type non-IDH mutant GBM tumor negatively impact the quality of life if taken by a patient who has already gone through standard of care treatments as well as surgeries? So I don't know if you're referring to taking the temozolomide in an MGMT unmethylated tumor, um, in which case, you know, we always discuss um, again, the data with patients, oftentimes in the absence of a clinical trial, I will still try temozolomide in an unmethylated tumor because, again, we don't have any better treatments or trials to offer, and there's not much to lose if they are otherwise tolerating it okay. So we monitor their blood counts, we monitor their symptoms, and if they're, they're doing okay, we would try at least for a couple of cycles to see how they do. That's been my approach anyway, again, because there hasn't been anything better. And we know that the data we have, again, you know, it's based on a, a number of population of sample. But at the end of the day, you know, I, you cannot guarantee 100% if this patient that you have in front of you, despite these markers, is going to behave like the rest of the curve. So I think to give patients the benefit of the doubt, we often would then try it anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, do you know when the data from the Indigo trial might be published? Yeah, so they have some interim data that is being you know, discussed at conferences in which there seems to be a pretty good response rate of these IDH inhibitors. I suspect that the actual trial will wrap up sometime around summer of next year. And again, we'll have sort of small updates, but the actual sort of wrap up will probably not be for another year or so, I suspect at least, or even longer, perhaps. Thank you. It says University of Sherbrooke is developing GlioTrap for diffuse gliomas. Do you have any, um, any thoughts around this potential treatment? Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what that trial or study is. I would have to look that up because, again, you know, we have different trials named different things. But, uh, you know, for sure, I think everyone right now is very interested at in looking at molecular markers and precision medicine and targeted therapies. Um, a good thing would be to always, and that's what I encourage all of my patients to do, is to just bring the information to your next appointment. And uh, if, like me, your physician isn't aware of this particular study, we tend to look them up and discuss them with you. Okay, thank you. Um, do we use MGMT mechanism for treatment by affecting temozolomide sensitivity? Can it be used for early stage detection as well? Um, so we're using it more, again, now to sort of help us predict whether or not we think patients will respond to the standard of care treatment. So it's not helping in the diagnosis per se. It helps more, you know, once you have a diagnosis to understand whether or not your tumor is going to respond to treatment. Um, down the line, we hope to explore ways to actually change the MGMT methylation or affect that pathway so that we can make tumors that are currently resistant to treatment may be more resist, more uh, susceptible to treatment. I think that would be sort of another nice uh, bullet to have in, in our, our treatment arsenal for sure. Great, thank you. Um, following surgery, why not administer agents directly into the tumor? So, so people are looking at that, you know, intratumoral tumor injections, intratumoral virus injections, uh, a lot of clinical trials have looked at that too. So putting chemotherapy directly in the brain. Um, there isn't one that I would say has a, a very good track record uh, because again, there's no way to continuously do that. So you'll have to sort of eventually close up, you know, the patient and then there's no way to routinely continue administering that. Um, they, the, the trials have so far not been too successful. Uh, but I'm sure people are looking at developing other and newer ways of doing this in, in a safe way. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, there's a couple of comments that were, okay, I think just this last question. Um, focused ultrasound therapy. I don't know if you can comment on that. It's kind of a tool to deliver drugs to CNS or is it a treatment itself? Yeah, so it is both. I would say in the treatment of gliomas, uh, right now it's being investigated as a way 
to open up the blood brain barrier and let in the chemo. So it would be used in conjunction. Uh, they've looked at actually using the focused ultrasound, the actual ultrasound to break up the tumor or to affect the tumor, in, like almost in a surgical way or in the same way that radiotherapy, radiation therapy would. And it hasn't been as effective in that sense. So we're using it as, a, as an adjunct or as a, a mechanism to break up the blood brain barrier and then add on uh, a drug at the moment. Um, it is being used in other types of diseases. So things like Parkinson's disease, depression, to actually directly, like I said, localize, uh, provide localized treatment to areas of the brain to then stimulate uh, production of dopamine or you know, uh, neurotransmitters to help in things like depression, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So it's a really interesting area and one that you know, uh, we've had a lot of experience with at Sunnybrook. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, somebody was asking about the presentation. We are recording it, so it will be uploaded to um, our website. And um, there was another question, is gamma knife surgery still used and how much success? I don't know. I, that's a kind of a different topic, but um, I can send you information about that uh, to the person who has asked. So I can follow up via email regarding gamma knife. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Limfat, I really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule Thank to be you. with us and uh, to share your knowledge and your expertise. And uh, if any other questions come through via email, I'll touch base with you directly. And uh, for everybody who's online, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, yeah, keep an eye out for the recorded version up on our website. We will send an email out to everybody who registered to let you know when that is up in the next week or so. And um, that's it. That's our last webinar of the year. So please make sure to complete the survey when you close out of here. And uh, we'll see you all in 2022. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Janique. Thank you, everyone. Take care.